I believe marketing will cease to exist within less than a decade from today to be replaced by the experience economy. Why? Marketing implies at. I will communicate at you. I will create content. I will disrupt my consumer. Engaging with the consumer and creating immersive experiences applies with. And we all know that a one-way communication campaign is the same as a one-way relationship. One-way relationships don't work. But by engaging with our consumer and creating immersive experiences for our consumer, we create a two-way relationship. And I'd like to share with you some stories from my 30 years at Disney about how we could uh, essentially re-energize, um, re reinvest, and uh, re-engineer our relationship with our consumers in this, what I call, the experience economy. But if you think of the word of experience, the first, word, uh, the first name that comes to mind is Walt. Last name, Disney. <laughs> Who here saw Fantasia at the movies? It came out in 1940. Walt wanted it in 1940. He was so far ahead of everybody else. He wanted it to mist inside the theater during drip, drip, drip with clay push hours. He wanted heat pumped in during night on a bare mountain. He wanted to create a fully immersive experience for his guests. And the theater owner said, no, Walt, that's too expensive. And your movies are only here for a limited period of time. So Walt wanted to re-engineer his relationship with his consumer. He was frustrated that he couldn't control the environment with which his consumers consumed his products. So he asked the question, what if I could control the environment? Well, that wasn't provocative enough. So he said, what if I take my movies out of the theater? Well, if I take my movies out of the theater, clearly they couldn't be two-dimensional anymore. Well, what if I made them three-dimensional? Hmm. Well, if I made them three-dimensional, I'd have to have people play the characters. If I had people play the characters, Cinderella couldn't live next to Davy Crockett or Jack Sparrow because people wouldn't be immersed in her story. So I'd have to create a different land. Oh, wait a minute. Why don't I call it Disneyland? And with that, the experience economy was born by simply asking how might we re-engineer our relationships with our consumers. Fast forward to, gosh, 2005, 2010. We were charged by Disneyland Paris with getting more consumers to come to our park. And our data told us who could afford a visit. Our data told us who had an affinity to the brand. Our data told us um, who'd been shopping online. Our data told us who was a 10 out of 10 of I'm coming this year. But they hadn't come. So clearly, our data was missing something. And so, by a show of hands, let me ask you, before I go further, who here has children? Lady at the front, would you mind joining me up on the stage? Come on up. Give this lady a round of applause. Bring it in. Can I borrow a microphone, please? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. How are you doing? Nice to meet you. Um, what's your name? It's Reese. Reese, can I ask you to close your eyes for us? Sure. Um, somewhere in your house, I dare say, is a photograph of your children. More than one. More than one. I want you to focus on a particular photograph of your children in a particular room and tell me when you can picture it. Okay. Okay. Tell us which room it's in. It's in the hallway. In the hallway. Is it on a bookshelf or is it hanging on the wall? No, it's hanging on the wall. Okay. Is it in a frame? Yes. Okay. Uh, what's the frame look like? Uh, brown and gold, little ridges okay. around it. Women are really good at the frame. Men are a disaster <laughs> at the frame. It's, oh, it's brown. Um, <laughs> so tell us, um, who's in that photograph? Um, my husband, my daughter, and I. Okay, and your daughter's name? It's Lauren. Lauren. And where were you when the picture was taken? Um, we were in Boise, Idaho. Boise, Idaho. Yeah. Um, and how old was Lauren when the photograph was taken? She was five years old, little gap teeth, and big smile. And, <laughs> and how old is Lauren today? Do I have to say that? Yes. She's 32. All right. Oh, well, thank you very much. And I'm much. only oh. 33. No. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you so much. Lovely to meet you. Thank you. 
So here's what we found. Don't forget, our going in hypotheses was we build it, they will come. Why? Well, we've always done it that way. We're a product-centric organization. We build it, you'll come. But that's millions of dollars of investment. But our data had been missing why the people who were of 10 out of 10 out of 10 didn't come this year. So we decided to go and spend a day in the living room of 26 of our consumers for a day and seek insights for innovation by looking where our competition wasn't looking. And we found the same clue that Risi told us. How do I know? Because you have the same photographs in all of your houses. What we found on average was the, ch the children were anywhere from two years to 27 years older in reality. You have those pictures of your children in your living room. And for those of you who are younger, your parents still have the dorky one of you in their living room that you wish they would got rid of years ago. So there was something our intuition was telling us. Do we not print photographs of our children anymore? No, we still print photographs of our children. So we spent time with five of the mums and did a deeper dive. And here's what parents would tell you at first pass. We want our children to grow up. We want them to go to kindergarten, junior school, middle school, high school, college, graduate, be happy, healthy, successful, and get a job. Who wants that for their kids? No, you're lying to me. <laughs> Reese is lying to me. She wants Lauren back in that photo frame. When Reese walks in the door at night, Lauren is Wonder Woman or Superman, right? And she rushes to her legs. I get quite jealous now when I see young children in airports running towards their parents because I'm lucky if the dog grunts when I walk through the door. Uh, <laughs> so there is something here that we were onto. Again, our intuition told us there's something here. Dig a bit deeper. So we did. And here's what we found. There are three bittersweet transitions that will take place between a parent and a child. As you step through that transition, you instantly both want to step back, but you both know it's too late and there's nowhere to go. Now, these were 26 mums telling me this story, but I'm a dad, I've got kids, I can use my intuition. And they talked about these three bittersweet transitions, and I will tell you where I was for all three. I know exactly where I was. It was Christmas Eve, Monterrey, Mexico. Uh, James, who was 10 at the time, came around Abelito's bedroom door that way. He had on a navy blue shirt with a collar, polo shirt, brown shorts, nothing on his feet, and his eyes half full of tears, bubbling, just as children do just before they burst out crying. Papa, are you Santa Claus? I was like, ooh. <laughs> Didn't see that coming. It hurt. And I was going to lie. And he said, Mummy said, you are. In that split second, imagination, creativity, clouds, Batman, Superman, gone. But what really hurt was what he had really said. I'm not your little boy anymore, Daddy. I'm growing up. I had very hard to keep it together. The second bittersweet transition, girls, you will not remember where you were that day. Dads, you will. And girls, you can test me when you go home tonight. You can text or call your dad and ask him the question. He will answer you in a split second, and I don't care if it was 27 years ago. I was by the curb. My daughter was inside me. There was a black uh, Chrysler Pacifica minivan coming this way. Michael's craft store is here. She's 13 that Tuesday morning, the day she dropped my hand in public for the first time. Because she didn't want to hold daddy's hand in public anymore because it was embarrassing. And you can ask a dad where he was that day and he will answer you in a split second. And he will tell you if it was his right hand or his left hand because it is a seminal moment between a father and a daughter. And the last one, for us at least, we used to, we live in central Florida, we used to drive our daughter up to university and back and you would unpack a third of the room and pack and unpack and pack and she graduated last year. She got her first job in Manhattan. I've only been in her bedroom once. Can't walk in it. It's too tidy, too quiet, too empty. So we went up to Manhattan, packed her into her apartment. We cheered, we laughed, we hugged. And then my wife and I got in the Uber 
on the way out to LaGuardia, and we cried our eyes out all the way to the airport. Don't forget, our going in hypotheses was we build it, they will come. Why? Because that's the way we've always done it here, since July 17th, 1955. It's always worked that way, and our data told us that. But what we found by spending the day with the consumer, and not just relying on our data, but by getting out of behind our desks and spending a day reinventing our relationship with the consumer by actually spending a day with them, we learned that mum does not wake up in the morning going, oh, do you know what? I wonder if Disneyland Paris is going to have new products this year. It's not even on her, on her radar screen. Mum wakes up every morning worried about how quickly her children are growing up and how she wants to make special memories for them while they still believe, while they still hold my hand, while they're still here. That's not a capital investment strategy. We could have spent hundreds of millions of dollars on new product that she didn't want. Instead, it was a communication campaign aimed at parents of small children while they still believe dad of a tween daughter, because you could break his heart in a nanosecond, <laughs> while she'll still hold your hand, and parents of older children, while they're still here. A communication campaign that drove record sales to Disneyland Paris, and turned a very conservative, product-centric, we build it, they will come culture, into a consumer-centric culture, where it's now mandatory for Disney executives to work at least two days a year in a frontline cast member position in the theme park reinventing our relationships with our guests. The third story I want to talk about is about re-expressing that relationship. Walt was the master of re-expression. With three weeks to go to the opening of Disneyland, the landscape artists came to Walt. Notice I said landscape artists, I did not say gardeners. And said, Walt, we're out of time, we're out of money, and we're out of resources, what should we do? Two thirds of the flower beds are full of weeds. And Walt said, well, let's find out the Latin names and we'll tag all of them with their Latin names. <laughs> On July 17th, 1955, Disneyland opened its doors with two-thirds of its flower beds full of exotic plants yet to grow into fruition. <laughs> but that's not the important story. The important story is Walt said, we will not have any customers in our parks. We will only have guests. Now think about how you feel when you're treated as a customer and think about crossing the threshold of your best friend's house and how you're treated when you visit a Disney park. Not only that, we will not have any employees. We will only have cast members, cast for a role in the show. They'll wear a costume, not a uniform. They'll work on stage, not backstage. And with that, he gave us a badge of honor that I protected Walt's legacy for 30 years. A friend of mine, he, his name is Hector Rodriguez. He's a boat driver at Epcot. He's driven the boats for 30 years. But on the odd occasion, he comes over to the house. He comes bursting through the door, massive smile on his face. He said, you should see what I did for that guest today. And he'll tell you with immense pride what he did. Why? Hector's a Disney cast member. In 2011, instead of saying, how might we make more money, we reversed and re-expressed the question. Who here has been to a Disney park? And what's the biggest pain of going to a Disney park? We asked, instead of saying, if we'd asked how might we make more money, we could put the gate price up by 3%, we'd have met our quarterly results. That's called iteration, not innovation. But we simply re-expressed the question and said, how might we solve the biggest consumer pain point? What if we eliminated the front desk in our hotels, the turnstiles in our four parks, what if you didn't stand in line for your favorite attractions or your meet and greets or food and beverage or merchandise? Well, RFID technology had existed for many years. We simply put it in a Disney magic band. Now, you swipe and go. You don't check in. It is your room key. It's your theme park ticket. It's your reservations for your favorite attractions and character meet and greets. You want some merchandise? You can pay for it. It goes to your hotel. Food? You touch table 47. It comes fresh to you. If we'd started by saying, how might we make more money, we would have made our quarterly results. But by simply asking, how might we solve the biggest consumer pain point, the average consumer has about one and a half to two hours free time a day in a Disney park they didn't have four years ago. And what is it you lovely people do with your free time in Disney theme parks? 
The single biggest revenue generating idea since Disneyland opened its doors on July 17, 1955. No capital investment required. No new attractions, no new lands, no new parades, no new fireworks, no new shows. Software. Data. Millions of people every day and every year are live crowdsourcing the future products, designs, and services that Disney parks create because they are crowdsourcing and telling Disney what they like and what they don't like. So simply, by re-engineering your experience to create immersive entertainment where consumers can come and touch and feel and play with your brand, by reinventing your relationship with your consumer, by having the courage to step away from your data sometimes in your desk and simply spending a day in their lives, and by not asking the question, how might we make more money, but ask, how might we solve the biggest consumer pain point? I believe you can not only survive, but thrive in what I believe will be the most disruptive decade of our lives, in what I call the experience economy. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>